This is the official GMAT mini quiz from MBA.com and it's only eight questions. But for even those students who are studying the GRE and other exams, almost all the questions will be in common. The quant that's tested on the GMAT is very similar to the quant that's tested on the GRE. With verbal, there's only a slight difference with sentence correction versus sentence equivalence. But again, you can still learn a lot from that. I haven't seen these questions before, and I presume most of you haven't seen these questions before. So I encourage you to pause the video before hearing my answer to each question and see what you would think. So that way you get to do the quiz at the same time. And you can compare your approach to my approach. I'm going to go for a roughly timed approach. So I will take a little bit of time to explain my answers. But I'm going to try and match the speed that we would expect for the GMAT or the GRE. So that means for eight questions, you'd expect to take about 16 minutes, give or take. If I can squeeze in some extra teaching, you know me, I will try and do that. But I'm also going to try and do it under roughly timed conditions. OK, let's get started on the questions. Click this, presumably. Here we go. Question number one. Select the best of the answer choices given. The interview is an essential part of a successful hiring program, okay? Because with it, job applicants who have personalities that are unsuited to the requirements of the job will be eliminated from consideration. This argument logically depends on which of the following assumptions. So this is a critical reasoning question, obviously. And what I recommend for those is try to spot the weakness yourself of the passage before you even look at the answers. And for me, they gave one reason why an interview is good, because we can eliminate the personalities that are unsuited. But that leaves so many possibilities. Are there other ways to weed out people with unsuitable personalities? So there's definitely at least one flaw, I would say, with this passage. But anyway, let's get on to the answers here on the right. The argument logically depends on which of the following assumptions. A hiring program will be successful if it includes interviews. I don't think it assumed that even with interviews, it will definitely be successful because there's other conditions to success. The interview is a more important part of a successful hiring program than development of a job description. It never compared an interview to a job description. So I don't like that. There was no comparison there. Interviewers can accurately identify applicants whose personalities are unsuited to the requirements of the job. That's a good one because you are assuming that interviewers can actually spot those personalities. It's no good having an interview to weed out bad personalities if you can't even spot those bad personalities. At this point, I could cheat and use a method that I think I've talked about in another video called negation technique. Or maybe I haven't, I need to do a video on that, I don't know. By the way, if we say the opposite to this one, does it destroy the conclusion that the interview is essential? Yes, because if we say the opposite to this one, interviewers cannot accurately identify applicants whose personalities are unsuited, then this entire argument falls apart. And that's a negation technique. And it's so useful. I'm actually so confident in C. I'd probably just pick it and move on now. I can very briefly look at the others and say the only purpose, well, we never talked about only, and E, it being the most important factor, we never compared the factors. So very confident in C here. OK, this one it looks like a sentence correction, which wouldn't come up in the GRE. Obviously useful for those doing the GMAT or just in those people who want to improve their English anyway. This question presents a sentence, part of which is underlined. You will find five ways of phrasing the underlined part. The first of these repeats the original, like in all GMAT sentence correction questions, but the other four are different. If you think the original is best, choose the first answer. Otherwise, choose one of the others. So for sentence correction, your best friend is literally just sounding out which one sounds the best. And if that doesn't work, we rely on the 20 or 30 sentence correction tricks that we know for the GMAT. Now, I haven't done many videos or even any videos on sentence correction on my channel. And if you request it, I'll try to do more on that. OK, executives and federal officials say that the use of crack and cocaine is growing rapidly among workers, significantly compounding the effects of drug and alcohol abuse, so far so good, which already are a cost to business, and that's dodgy, which already are a cost to business of more than. 
you would say something like, which already costs business more than, rather than saying, it's too wordy to say, which already are a cost to business of more than 100 billion a year. It's too many words there. So it was fine until it got to the end. Let's check these answers. So A is the same, so I'm not liking A. This ending here, significantly compounding the effects of drug and alcohol abuse, which already cost business. There you go. Perfect. It's a much shorter way of saying the same thing as A. In the real test, I probably would pick it and move on to save time, but I will check the others. Significantly compounding the effects of drug and alcohol abuse already with business costs, with dodgy, no. Significant in compounding the effects. I mean, this significant starting is just dodgy. Like what's significant? You're not clarifying what you're talking about. Whereas significantly in adverb, we know we're talking about what came before. So it's a bad start here. Significant in compounding the effects of drug and alcohol abuse and already costing. Well, yeah, okay, so it's a dodgy start and same with E. Anyway, I was confident it was B and in the real test, I would have picked that and then just moved on. As I say, if enough people request me to do sentence correction videos, I will do them. I realize they're not as in demand as other video types because they don't come up in the GRE. So I have to balance what people want. Okay, next one. And the next one is, what is this? Uh, looks like critical reasoning. After reading the passage, choose the best answer to each question. Answer the question on the basis of what's stated or implied in the passage. Actually, this looks like a reading comp, but a short one. The number of patents granted to inventors by the United States Patent Office dropped from 56,000 in 1971 to 45,000 in 1978. Oh dear. Spending on research and development, which peaked at 3% of gross national product in 1964, was only 2.2% of GMP in 1978. Notice I am reading slowly and critically engaging. During this period, when the United States percentage was steadily declining, West Germany and Japan increased the percentage of their GMP spent on research and development to 3.2% and 1.6% respectively. Good for them, but we don't know how big their economy is, so 1.6% of a much smaller economy could be rubbish, but anyway. Which of the following conclusions is best supported by the information above? A. There is a direct relationship between the size of a nation's GMP and the number of inventions it produces. Ooh, not really. That's too strong. It actually talked about the two different things, but it never said they're directly related. It never said, oh, if we spend more, therefore we'll get more patents. It said one fact and said another fact. But it never actually said, oh, they're definitely linked. So I don't like A, even though many of you might have been uh, tempted by that. Japan and West Germany spent more money on research and development in 1978 than did the United States. We don't know that. I talked about that because we don't know the size of their economies. So 3.2% of what? How big was their economy? So not B. The amount of money a nation spends on R&D is directly related to the number of inventions patented in that nation. Isn't that just the same as A? The amount of money a nation spends on R&D... Oh, that was GNP and this is R&D. Again, it didn't say they're directly related. It gave you one fact, gave you the other one. So I don't like that. Between 1964 and 1978, the US consistently spent a large percentage of its GNP. Well, it did say the US was 3% and then 2.2%. And it said Japan, which was the second of these two countries, was 1.6%. And it didn't just say that, it said, it increased the percentage to 1.6%. So before it must have been even lower. So it looks like, do we know the dates though? Yeah, 1964 and 1978. So it is the right dates. So D is looking very, very good. And E just quickly looks rubbish. Both those two countries will soon surpass the United States in the number of patents granted to inventors. Even though common sense might say that's correct, for the GMAT and GRE, you don't make those kind of leaps. You don't make those kind of assumptions. We don't know if it will carry on this trend. So E is incorrect. Okay, happy with that one. Next one. Oh, so it was critical reasoning. It was just one question. Oh, well. Da -da -da -da, don't need to read that. Like Auden, the language of James Merrill. This is one of the 30 tricks that I talked about that I haven't yet done videos on for sentence correction. Like is when you're comparing two nouns that are comparable. Here, we're saying like Auden, 
who's a poet or a person, the language of James Merrill. That's not a correct comparison. We're comparing a person to language. A correct comparison would be something like, like Auden, James Merrill, or like Auden's language, the language of James Merrill. Then we're comparing language with language. But it's not a correct use of like to compare Auden with the language of James Merrill. So this is a classic comparison type question for sentence correction. If you're wondering about as, by the way, as is where you're comparing actions. That's how I remember it. So just as Susan liked to drink this, so too Jimmy liked to drink that. It's an action. Just as she's doing this, he's doing that. Anyway, we can quickly get the answer here to save time. That's a false comparison. This is a false comparison B because we're comparing Auden to his language. And C looks good. Like Auden's language, James Merrill's language. The apostrophe S says that we're talking about Auden's language. So correct comparison, don't need to spend much time. And that's going to be the correct answer. This one, quant. The GRE students among you will be glad to see quant here because this could all come up in the GRE as well. On a three-day fishing trip, I just realized I don't have my notepad here, so I'm going to do all this in my head. <laughs> On a three-day fishing trip, four adults consume food costing $60. Very good. For the same food cost per person per day. Okay, before I carry on reading, I honestly would work that out. What were the food costs per person per day? Well, 60 divided by 4 is 15, so each adult paid $15, but that was across three days, so per day it was $5. So we know each adult paid $5 per day for food. For the same food cost per person per day, notice I worked out before I kept reading, what would be the cost of food consumed by seven adults during a five-day fishing trip? Seven adults times $5 times five days, that would be 7 times 5 is 35, times 5 is 175, I believe. Pretty confident in that. And notice how I worked out step by step. In one day, one adult pays $5 for food. So 7 adults would pay $35 in one day. 5 days, you times that by 5. Okay, Let's see if this gets harder. The number of rooms at Hotel G is 10 less than twice the number of rooms at Hotel H. Ouch, this is going to be algebra, which I would normally need to write down. But I'm going to try and do this in my head. But you please do write this on a page because otherwise it will be quite hard to follow along. So let's create some equations. The number of rooms at Hotel G is, so G equals 10 less than twice Hotel H. So the equation here would be G equals 2H minus 10. Don't write, many of you would have done this, 10 minus 2h. Think about it. 10 less than 2h is 2h minus 10, not 10 minus 2h. That's very commonly confused, and I've done a couple of videos on this, age equations and such, but be careful. If it says hotel G is 10 less than twice h, we write G equals, and then not 10 minus 2h, even though that's the order in which the words come, it's 2h minus 10. That represents 10 lower than 2h. So that's the first equation. If the total number of rooms at Hotel G and Hotel H is 425, so that's quite simple, that's G plus H equals 425, what is the number of rooms at Hotel G? So because this is a fairly simple simultaneous equation, we can just use the substitution method. They've already told us that G equals 2h minus 10, so we can simply sub that into the second equation, g plus h equals 425, and we get 2h minus 10 plus h equals 425. I've replaced the g in the second equation with 2h minus 10. 2h minus 10 plus h is 3h minus 10 equals 425. Add 10 to both sides, 3h equals 435, and now we are going to divide that by 3. See if I can do that in my head. That will be 145. I think I got that right. 435 divided by 3 is 145, I think. Either way, if Hotel H is 145, we'll quickly find out Hotel G by putting that into the second equation. So G plus 145 equals 425. Taking away 145 from both sides, 
and we would get 280, I believe, for Hotel G. So I think I did that right in my head, but this is a relatively simple simultaneous equation question. If that was too much for you to take in without any visuals, then do re-watch the video or watch any of my other videos on simultaneous equations. I did a separate video on simultaneous equations with many questions worked through on the screen with algebra. This was more meant to be a quick quiz. So let's move on. Is the average arithmetic mean of X and Y greater than 20? Ah, this is data sufficiency. So the questions aren't quite asked like this in the GRE, but the maths is still fun. They're basically asking which of these two statements or both of them are sufficient to answer that question. And the question is, is the average of X and Y greater than 20? And this looks like a fairly simple question because they're asking about the average of X and Y. And then in statement one, they tell us the average of two X and two Y is 48. Well, divide by two, that means the average of X and Y is 24. So that would answer the question. So that statement is sufficient. Whereas statement two is just saying X is three times bigger than Y. But without knowing what X is, or what Y is, that could be three and one, or 300 and 100. We don't know the actual numbers for X and Y. So we can't say whether the average would be greater than 20. We're clicking A because statement one alone is sufficient, but statement two is not sufficient. That was a relatively easy data sufficiency question, asking which statement would help us answer the question. And finally, this one. Can the positive integer P be expressed as the product of two integers, each of which is greater than one? Always break down the question before you look at the statements. That's what I always say to my GMAT students studying data sufficiency. Break down the question, think about the question before you look at the statements. Otherwise the statements can confuse and distract you. We need to think about what the question is actually asking us. Can an integer P be expressed as a product of two integers? Well, what kind of numbers can't be expressed as a product of two integers? That would be prime numbers. So by asking you whether it can be expressed as a product of two integers, almost every number can be, right? Like 20 is 10 times two. The only numbers that can't be are primes. So that entire wordy question is simply asking you, is P a prime? Well, statement one, it's in that range. Now, what are the numbers in that range? What are the integers? 32, that's not prime. 33, that's not prime. 34, that's not prime. 35, that's not prime and 36, which is not prime. So if we know P is in that range and we know P is an integer, we know for sure that P is not prime. And so statement one alone is enough to answer the question. In other words, statement one tells us that P can be expressed as a product of two integers because P can't be a prime. There are no primes in that range. Whereas statement two, P being odd, that doesn't tell us whether P is prime or not. A lot of odds are prime, but a lot of odds aren't prime. So that's not sufficient. So I would pick A and let's find out my result. I'm pretty confident here. I did it. Oh, <laughs> show me my score. Thank you for taking to see your score, provide your email address. Okay, I'm gonna pause the video, fill this in just so I can see my score. I'll be back in a second. And I got all eight right, which is obviously to be expected as a tutor. But the main purpose of this video was to give you an introduction to some of the GMAT style ways of asking these questions and to show you some of my verbal reasoning and quant techniques in action. I know I haven't done many GMAT specific videos recently, so this is filling that hole. And if you do want more GMAT content on my channel, please do leave this a like and leave a comment. Thank you for watching.